Thank you. Oh my God, you guys are all, that's a lot of people. When I was in college, I'd be sleeping. <laughs> Good for you. Well done. Um, I'd like to thank LSIE for having me. Um, and I tried to find the happiest poems in this book, which are not a lot of them, but I tried really hard um, to find that. And thank you, Dan, for leaving the, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start into the poems and work my way out. Mm -hmm. um, I could say something inappropriate. It happens almost all the time. And I'm continually incapable of keeping my mouth shut. So we'll start out with the work and see where it takes us. Theodore Bilbo attends my soak bed. When the ache was just too much, I skipped down the hill to the slip where you and a small boat was always waiting. There, we draw out the sloop into the glassy-eyed water and sit for hours in silence. The fish would swim up to the hull, coming up just short of the surface, and then turn away again with their white bellies writing surrender, surrender upon the water. Maybe there never was any river. Maybe the only true thing is I would come back to the island, lift its lush grasses and earth to myself, and call it my body. Maybe the only true thing is that you held my lolling hand, my head between your hands and whispered, I await a reckoning. Is this one? The body sings to all its parts. Um, when I was writing this, I was, I was very sick and my family was all dying. Um, I don't mean this dramatically. My family was actuarially very old and they were all dying one at a time. And we're black, so we have like black people diseases. Like it's, their times were up. That's all I'm saying. So <laughs> I had <laughs> in that five months, um, five aunts die. This kind of dropped dead and then my grandmother died at 97, um, it was just, there, yeah, it was just a very strange time for all of us. And I was sick and we were all talking about, we, the ones who were left, we'd all kind of sit there at like, wondering which one was next at the table. Um, so this is called The Body Sings to All Its Parts. Zora, Ethel, Mary, Miga, Dot, and I are gathered here as though after war. We embrace and learn to love what is left of our bodies. We reach to one another, touching, touching the bodies we once knew whole, but we don't think of that. We have gathered, we have tea, we talk about the weather. When we speak of the weather, we speak of the bodies we saw in treetops and rooftops and their arms waving and waving before they were subsumed. Necessarily, when we are talking about weather, we're talking about the dead. We're talking of this body's tempests, how quickly it turns against itself, but we're not impolite. We maintain silence about the parts we had to surrender to live. We had only ourselves and the body to blame. We may wonder if our parts are belong for a kind of reunion in the by and by, but we have our doubts, and of those doubts, we could go on and on and on. and the years following rescue. I was drowning. I'd been drowning all my life and he found me in this place and I was saved. I loved the river and the river loved me. I was dying of such love. Do you know, I asked, of the world underwater? How the words come slow and as if from great distance? Where I am from, there is neither sky nor stars. I said this as we were sitting by the river. Here, he said, here is the wreck where you were found and you were lifted from its ruin. The words fled your mouth like hummingbirds, golden in the falling sun, hovering for a moment and then retreating back to darkness. Here, he said, when you were listening, listless and learning breath, you reached out to me as if to say, I want to live. And I did, I said, I did. And then I bent down and reached out my hand to stir the water. Um, 
I have a series in this book called about Meridian, Mississippi. Um, in part, Meridian, Mississippi is where my mother is from. Meridian, Mississippi is also, if anyone's ever seen the movie Mississippi Burning, uh, Meridian, Mississippi is where the Freedom House was, um, although the boys who died, um, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, um, they all died about three miles away in the town of Philadelphia, which is just over a hill off a little west. Um, this happened when my mother was 13. And I think, I, I'm positive there's, she's not right since, in the same way that the entire town is not right since. Um, in the way I may not be right since, knowing that that could happen. Um, this is actually 1963, Meridian, Mississippi, 1963. This is the year before uh, my mother had um, adolescent onset epilepsy. And so she would run home, kind of scared that she would have a seizure. And somehow she always managed to make it right as the door shut. I don't know. It's probably, she's stubborn. It's probably her. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is Meridian, Mississippi, 1963. My mother considers the my mother considers the mechanics of flight. I want to save you, dark girl of Thunderhead, dark girl falling upward. I want to tell you the voices fluttering in the dark of your body are all true. You will leave this place, and those who would harm you will pass over. Dark girl, even now you can't pay hell between your soft, slight bones, synapses firing all at once, first the aura, the borealis of yet red and yellow light sparking your firmament, your body thundering, writhing, thundering against the ground. What did you find in all those liminal places? Consider the jewel-throated hummingbird. Keep your wings by beating them faster than the human eye can see. Did your mother stand guard, gently thrust a stick into your mouth to hold the tongue to save it? Um, part of, look at the time, time check. We're good, okay. Right, we're good, we're good for three more prompts. Um, part of reading this, writing this book was about Meridian and about how to forgive Meridian for being Meridian. Um, because obviously I'm not gonna get an apology or no one else is getting an apology. So we have to really think about what forgiveness is and how do we live in a world where there is such injustice. Um, and how we still live and we're still happy. Um, because that can obviously, that shortens your life, I think, thinking about all the time about how unjust the world is. It is always unjust, has always been unjust. Really, actually, there's not even a pep talk, is it? No. Um, <laughs> but you still got, I mean, like, you still have to have Christmas and be happy. So, like, how do we actually process all of that? and still have a life where we can go forward. Um, in that, I did some research, and I was researching one in particular. It's um, during the Truth and Reconciliation pro, um, panels in Rwanda, um, one woman who was a Tutsi, um, she was locked in her neighbor's home. He was doing, redoing a bathroom, and so he taped her into the wall for four days um, until everything passed. And she got a chance to meet the guy that she knows killed her family. Um, and the burgomaster said, whatever you want to do, do to him, and walked away. And a testament to who she was, she looked at him and she, was, she knew that it, she would not be any better than him if she did. Although she had like changed, like he like gave her a whole set of stuff in case he wanted to do something. And she couldn't do it because she figured that would not save her either. So this is called, the burgomaster said I could do anything I wanted to you. And then added, I will turn my back and turn away. But as you entered the room, shuffling and jangling your chains and smelling of day after day after day of yourself, I thought of forgiveness, which is to say, I thought of myself. I stood without a word to offer. And then I remembered fire, and the fires we fled, and the day after night after day after night in darkness, and then the girl's screams and her dying, and the baby you left on the grass, crying and crying, until at last it didn't, and then the growling of the dogs. All the while you were silent and watching me as you'd always been. 
And as I turned to leave, I thought to myself, I can look away. I can choose to give you nothing. I can still save myself, save myself. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I'm just, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. I'm being thoughtful. That's all I'm doing. Um, I got, okay. Um, I had a bad relationship, like everybody else. And uh, I wrote this poem. This is the weirdest thing. So I wrote this poem, planning on reading it today. And we dated. He lived in New York. I live in Nashville. That was the end of it. Well, Saturday. I was out having drinks at this new bar, and there he was, just out with, I feel like if you break up with me, after a fiance breaks up with you, they should have some kind of like pass to like, hey, I'm coming to your town so I know where you are so I don't see them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw him, and I realized I had this crazy moment of like, I saw him, and it had like, you have all these speeches, and I just had nothing. I had like, not even I wish you were dead. I'm like, huh, that's weird. <laughs> um, that you are still alive because you were dead to me. It was a very strange, um, it's a very strange thing. But I did write this poem in this last book, so I obviously, he's not that dead. Um, it's called The Peonies at the Bodega. Were this a poem, and I were just arranging the sound, we'd be standing in rain and not snow. I would have left on foot and gathered my coat against weather. I would not have hailed a taxi. I would not raise my hand against the glass as, to, as if to gesture against morning. You would not be left behind standing among the hothouse flowers at the bodega at Mott, near Mott and Broom. When we made love that afternoon, you would have taken all your clothes off. You would have removed your left sock, for example. <laughs> In the poem I would write, the woman on the street would not have noticed how much we loved or that we fairly glowed with it. Nor would they bustle by, cluck clucking, smiling knowingly. In the poem, you would have hailed the cab yourself, open up the door and shut me up in it. I would have kept my eyes forward. I would not have watched you grow smaller and smaller through the rear window, and you would not have waved and waved and waved. In the poem, it would be near dusk, and there would be some kind of metaphor about how the earth participates in the ends of things. I'd mentioned the owners of Bodega were an old married couple restocking their produce to guard against decay. I'd mentioned the flowers, and they would be peonies, and peonies would stand in for something else. Sorry. I'm still making, I'm so many decisions. Like, I'm like, I made a decision, but I can like ignore these decisions. It's very, I feel very free right now. Um, <laughs> This one is Murdy, Mississippi, 1964. This is the year, um, it was the summer solstice that the boys went missing. And this is, I talked to my grandmother, she was dying about that day, and uh, she had never talked about it. I re realized that she had never talked about it. She was dying, and we just realized, have we talked about this? No, we hadn't. So we kind of sat down. So while the short story is, is that all the men came to the house, and they were in the front room, and my grandmother took all the children into the back room and turned on the radio really loud and held a dance lesson so they couldn't hear what was going on in the front room. Um, and so this is kind of my grandmother's experience. Meridian 1964, they moaned so much they called it song. And to that music, we swayed. And we called the music sweet. And we measured our days between our sorrows and our joys. Dark girl, so great were our joys, we named them for you. We prayed you'd live long enough so that your joy would outray our troubles. Do you remember the night we counted our missing? How after the house emptied of men, I took you to the back room, turned on the radio, and we danced? Remember how they found the bodies stacked like lumber beneath the earth dam? Did you know I came to you in the night, and I washed in your sleep, and I reached out to stroke your hair? I went from room to room in the dark, counting and recounting my children. Dark girl, those boys were stripped of their bark, huddled together as if from cold. Outside, the woman's cries bleated against the windows. To say this wasn't joy would be a lie. You were accounted for, 
You were held in the walls of this house. And for that reason, I sat in a chair in the parlor, and I sang songs of praise, and I watched the street from the inside and rocked myself to and fro. Um, I think this is going to be the last poem. Uh, how many minutes? Do it, really? Okay, we can, we can keep going. All right, okay, guys. How about you tell me when to stop, all right? Um. <laughs> I am going to read, okay, I'm going to have a two-poem warning. How about that? All right, I'm going to read three-poem warning. Theodore Bilbo and I survey the ruin. Um, part of this book is an imagining of my grandmother going to heaven with Theodore Bilbo. Um, one, my grandmother was continually incapable of not talking shit. So I think it would be very interesting <laughs> to see her with someone that she had something to say to. Um, and it's not that she personally knew Theodore Bilbo, but she grew up during the same time that Theodore Bilbo was governor and then senator of Mississippi. Um, I kind of started writing it, I was telling someone earlier, I started writing it and I kind of had these two characters that then suddenly began to talk to them, talk to each other and not to me, which was very weird and I just kind of felt like I was kind of recording it and watching it happen. Um, but this is one of them. Theodore and Bilbo and I survey the ruin. We have been parties to a magnificent wreck. But now all I know, my God, it's been so long, is open sea and I am adrift in it. So many suns and moons and constellations have passed overhead. I've forgotten myself. What I remember is my making, the falling, the flight, weightlessness, then consequence. And then you joined me and I rejoiced. But after so many suns and moons and so many days spent circling the water, long days and nights with neither bearing nor wind, we turned from one another, hands clasped, back to back, you measure the day, and I the night. The nights are so much longer now. I measure the distance between star to star, and I've begun renaming them, each for a different form of misery. <laughs> Panic, idleness, cold. When I run out of words, I make them up. I mouth the name for the resentment reserved, those, reserved for those only closest to you, <laughs> and the shame that one feels in need. The name for the slow, fragrant bloom of love to loathing. <laughs> Coincidentally, that name echoes my own. But tonight, I finish my work. The stars are so bright and close, and my misery is no longer of any use. It remains, you are not water for drinking. You are not sure. It remains, we are adrift, and we will waste away. Okay. Two poem warning. <laughs> After 40 days, go marry again. But she's only just here. That's her, that's her in the red dress. That's her too, fists full of balloons as if she would fly away. That's her at the bottom of the hill. She ran as fast as she could to the top, her arms wide, her cheeks flushed. She reached me breathless and toppled the both of us. That's her and her again, her black hair and pigtails held with yellow ball state parrettes. Girls of that age are particular about such things. I sleep in her room some nights with all the lights on and everything as she left it. There she is in Biloxi. There she is and there she is and there she is. There she is, bits of black hair and their earrings. They say, maybe it's not her. Look. There, the ball stay barrettes, yellow with flowers stretched around. There she is at Christmas. There she is that summer she grew three inches. They say, after 40 days, go marry again. But there she is, and there she is again with a girl from class. That girl is dead too. There she is at the carnival. There she is, her fists clenched in the balloons. There she is at the door, a lunchbox in one hand, waving with the other. At night, I pretend to sleep, 
And there she is, standing over me, as if there were words left to say. There she is, there she is in the dark. How it is to grieve. This isn't about the particulars. This isn't a story about the way that she cradled a mango in the gully of her hand. This isn't that she said that each fruit bears a memory. This one, the red earth and rainy season, or that one, the easy smile of the beloved. This isn't a story about my aunt that summer, the four o'clocks, how she asked me to kill them, and I kept killing them, and that they refused to die. This isn't a story about the wife you left, or left you. This isn't even about the leaving. It's about all the places you can't come back to. Those who leave and stay gone. The things that never leave. This pouring rain, for example. You and me in this room, alone and together in grief, for example. The words I want to offer in comfort, and how they fail. How ruin rises silently as flood. The way this body is not a sandbag, but how I will cover yours with mine, like now, my love, just like this. Thank you, thank you so much. I really need to turn the glass off.